We'll begin our first video over forces, uh, starting with the most sensible way possible with Newton's laws. Uh, we have them in order 1, 2, and 3. The order doesn't necessarily matter, but it's important that we know Newton's three laws in order to move forward with forces. Um, so we're going to start with the first one, where it states an object in motion or rest will stay in motion or rest unless, act upon, unless an outside force acts on it. Uh, this doesn't make you know, a ton of sense right off the bat, and you've had, probably had it explained to you in eighth grade, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail with it, and we're going to say that motion remains constant if the net force acting on the object is zero. So as long as the net force, which means the sum of all the forces, if the sum of all the forces on an object are zero, then the object's motion will remain constant. So that if it, then if it's at rest, it will stay that way. And if it's at motion, it will stay in that motion. Uh, it is the nature of all objects to do this. So all matter will continue to do this. They resist the change in motion. That's their biggest deal. And we learned in class the other day that to resist the change in motion is known as inertia. So if you try to move an object and it doesn't want to move, it has mass and therefore it has inertia. We call this thing mass. The main thing that inertia is is understanding that it has mass. The more mass an object has, the more inertia an object has, and that's in kilograms. So <clears throat> a larger mass has more inertia, a smaller mass has less inertia. Do not confuse mass with weight. Mass is how much matter an object has. Weight is taking that matter and acting gravity upon it. So you have a gravity acting on matter, and then it has weight. It has a property of gravity and mass together is weight. But other than that, mass is its own thing. And then our second law is net force equals mass times acceleration. And how this is normally written is that... Ooh, what just happened there? Okay. So the second law is force equals mass times acceleration, which you probably learned in eighth grade. But how it's meant to be written is that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force acting on the object and inversely proportional to the mass acting on the object. So the way this really should be stated is that forces accelerate objects. And it really should be called net forces accelerate objects because we could have a bunch of forces on an object and we need to find out what the net force is or the total force is on the object. And forces accelerate objects. Um, <clears throat> in order to fully understand what we're talking about here is, is if we talk about inertia being mass. So in our equation we have mass. So the object always has inertia. It resists change in motion. So if we have a large mass, the object should not accelerate very fast because it doesn't want to move very much. Uh, it's harder to get it going. If we have a large force uh, on a smaller mass, then it should accelerate quite a bit because the force will overcome that small amount of inertia. If we have a large amount of inertia, we need a larger force to make it have the same type of acceleration. So, uh, But if we had a large force, it should accelerate the object faster. So we're understanding that acceleration is directly proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass is very important. Uh, Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, basically, forces occur in pairs is probably the best way to put this. So if we had a <clears throat> car, and that's my car, it's not a great car, but that's my car, and it's going to hit a bug, and I drew a, a B, I think. What happens here is that we have an equal and opposite force on each object. They occur in pairs. So if the car is driving and it has a mass, uh, when the objects come in contact with each other, when they hit each other, there's forces applied to each other. And so the force that the car has and the force that the bug has are equal to each other. The bug will apply an equal force to the car as the car applies the exact same force to the bug. The difference is, is that the car has a very, very large mass, and so the force 
um, is primarily uh, the the net force is primarily by, by its mass. It has a very small acceleration. You can see that F equals capital M, really big M, little a. And the bug is a very very small mass, so it's going to have a very very large acceleration. And we innately are able to, as as living things, feel acceleration. We don't feel the force of gravity on us all the time, but when we got, get an elevator and it accelerates really quickly, our stomach drops. We feel that. We feel the acceleration. So in this case, if a bug hits our windshield, uh, many of us who have been driving for a while or have been in a car and seen a bug hit the windshield, you know the bug doesn't, it doesn't turn out real well for the bug. In that case, that large acceleration that it feels ends up being too much for its body to handle in this case. But in, for the car, it has such a small acceleration from the forces that they have on each other the car doesn't really have anything that happens to it that we can truly measure. It does occur. There is an acceleration on the car, but in the opposite direction from the bug, but it's not something we can really measure. Um, another example uh, is like a, a horse and a carriage. So that's my carriage. It's just basically a box on wheels, and then this is my failed attempt at a horse. And the horse is trying to pull the carriage. And it's going to apply a force in that direction. That's the force of the horse. And then the carriage is actually pulling back on the horse. Equal and opposite forces. So technically, they should go nowhere. But that's not really the case. We know that the horse is able to pull the carriage. And the reason the horse is able to pull the carriage is because it has some friction with its hooves and the ground that allows it to pull it. And so there are more forces acting on the horse or more forces by the horse than there are in the carriage, so there's more going in that direction. Uh, so the, the better way to say this one is for every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force, and they happen in pairs. So you draw one force on one object and the exact same magnitude of a force on the other object. So when we draw the forces on the horse, we draw only the forces acting on that object. So only forces acting on objects matter. In that case, we have the force of the horse, and then we have the force of friction with the ground, and then its force applied that it's using to propel itself with the, with the hooves, and it propels it forward while the carriage is just pulling back on the horse. So only the forces acting on objects matter. Um, let's do this a little bit further. Let's talk about something called weight. We've kind of discussed it just a second ago, but weight... is the force caused by gravity. It's the force of gravity on a mass. So <clears throat> if we have an object with mass m, what will end up happening is, is that mass m will be accelerated at a rate of 10 meters per second squared or 9.8 meters per second squared downward. And so that mass has a weight that we call F equals mg. So mg, g being gravity, so the weight of the object is the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of gravity pulling on it. So weight is the force of gravity on a mass. So if we have an object that is sitting on the ground, the object doesn't all of a sudden not have weight anymore because it's not falling, and gravity is not all of a sudden acting on it because it's sitting on a surface. There's still, there is still the force of gravity acting on it. In this case, we have mg still, so that's, it still has weight. It's not falling anymore, but it still has weight, so we like to talk about that as its weight. And then in that case, since the surface is pushing against it in an equal and opposite direction, the normal force is what we call that. Is, it's basically a surface force. It's normally occurring. So we have the surface force, and... They're equal and opposite, so the object is at rest. So the net force is zero, and we should know that. And so at that point, we write down that the net force is going to be equal to the sum of the two forces we have. We have normal force up, and then we have gravity down, which is basically saying in a negative direction. So we can add them together plus a negative, or we can subtract them. Either way, it doesn't matter. And so we have the net force equals Fn minus Fg, or the net force is Fn plus a negative Fg, and then they are going to equal zero because they are equal and opposite. So technically, Fn equals Fg. So now we're going to talk about here a little bit 
in the idea of what a normal force does. A normal force is a surface force. So if we have a ramp here that you see, and we have the object on the ramp, the surface force is always at a 90 degree angle to the surface. It's pushing straight out from its surface. So the normal force will change directions based on the surface, and then the gravity is always straight down. It's, it's right toward the center of the Earth, so it really never really changes direction. So for us, it's always straight down wherever you're present. And so this box that's on this ramp, so we're trying to push a box up a ramp and put it in a, a moving truck, for example. Gravity's still acting straight down, but the normal force, the surface force has changed direction because the ramp has an angle, and it's perpendicular to the ramp's surface at that angle. So, um, perpendicular, writing that down to make sure we all have it, is very important. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is friction. So we're going to move on from that, and we're going to talk about friction. And friction is the force that opposes motion. So if you're moving in one direction, then friction is going to oppose you in the other. If you're rolling a ball, and we all see it, a ball kicked on a soccer field, for example, a soccer ball kicked on a soccer field, and the ball is rolling, uh, ends up coming to a stop because the grass is causing enough friction to slow it down. So friction is the force that opposes motion between two surfaces in contact. So we have a ball being a surface and the grass being the other surface. So what we're going to talk about is an example. We're going to use a 30 kilogram object, and this 30 kilogram object is going to have a weight and its weight will be mg, which is 300 newtons in this case, 30 times gravity being 10, so 300 newtons down. And then the surface is pushing back against it in an equal and opposite direction because it's not levitating, it's not falling to the ground or through the ground, so they are equal and opposite. And then we're going to apply a 100 newton force in the other direction. Now friction is pretty easy to calculate if you know the coefficient. So the coefficient is represented by a goofy-looking m, known as mu, and it's in the Greek alphabet, and our mu is going to be 0.5. So we're going to have a frictional force acting on this, and how we calculate friction is with mu, so the coefficient, times the normal force. So it's, it's really very simple. We take 0.5, because that's our coefficient, it's our constant. Uh, it will be given to you in problems, or they'll give you enough everything else to calculate what the coefficient is. Uh, but here it's given to you as 0.5, and then our normal force is 300. So we multiply those two things together, and we get that the frictional force is 150 newtons. In this particular case, if we're pushing with 100 newtons, and friction is capable of pushing with 150, then our object will not move. Uh, we used an example in class about how if I was pushing on a table or sitting on a table, it's a reactionary force. So if I'm 100 newtons, the table will, sh will push back 100 newtons. If somebody else sits on the table, then it'll, and they're 150 newtons, it'll push back with 150 newtons. But that table ends up having a limit to where it's something so massive or so heavy sits on top of it that the table may end up breaking, and there's a limit to its normal force. Well, friction is the same way. It has a maximum force that it can push at, uh, and it's reactionary. So if we push with 100 newtons, in this particular example, even though friction is capable of 150 newtons, the, the box is not going to move, and friction is only going to push at exactly what it needs to push at to oppose motion. So it's only going to push at 100 newtons. So the box does not move, and the frictional force is 100 newtons. Um, if we push with 150 newtons, technically the box would not move because friction is opposing it at 150. We would have to push at just over 150 newtons. Um, but that is, that is friction. So uh, from this video, make sure we understand that we, uh, what the weight of an object is equal to, how to calculate friction, and we'll get into different types of friction, uh, kinetic and static, and we'll get into all that whole process. And then we also need to understand uh, Newton's three laws. So uh, we'll practice some of this stuff in class.